great. So thank you all for attending today and for having me. Um, before I do say anything though, I'm gonna put my hands up and I have to throw up the forward looking statement um, because we're gonna be talking about a lot of the Trailhead DX announcements and pilot features. And just to make sure that you make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on the currently available technology and not any of the new cool stuff we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but just to introduce myself, so my name is Stefan Chandler Garcia, uh, and I'm a developer evangelist at Salesforce. I've just recently joined the team. Um, prior to March, I was a technical architect um, in London for Salesforce. And prior to that, I've ran a partner for many years, um, built app exchange solutions, as well as was a customer. So I've, I've played all, all parts of the Salesforce hat and have now joined this great team um, to help really developers get to closer to our content and create really useful resources uh, to then distribute and then get to talk to user groups like you today. Um, but more importantly, thank you um, for coming and attending. Thank you for organizing the user group. I actually used to run a user group in London myself and just hoping that people come up and expecting that people come to the meeting is really important and so great that everyone would be able to show up today. And secondly, to keep the meetings going virtually, I think is a great feat. It takes a lot to organize a meeting and then to start bringing it online, I think is really, really cool. Um, and I'm really grateful that all of you are doing that. Now, um, from a content perspective today, we had a little discussion last week about how deep we can get into some of the new features. Um, and we've put together a rough overview of some of the content, some of which we can, some of which we can't talk about in detail today. But really, I wanted to do just a quick overview of Trailhead DX. Um, if you were lucky enough to get up really early and attend online, or if you watched back some of the content, it'd be great to talk about some of that. I then want to go through some of the main product announcements and give you a bit more detail from some of those. Um, and then we talked about focusing on some of the communities updates. So I want to show some of the communities development updates from this last release, or this release that may be hitting you next week if you don't already have it. And then some of the data privacy manager and the consent event stream stuff that I can get hands on with, um, because that was one of the sessions that was mine at Trailhead DX. Now, if you've never been to Trailhead DX in person or Dreamforce in person, I can assure you that if you felt exhausted after watching a lot of the content, so did I. Um, it's a lot of information to take in in just a few hours time. Um, but I do have to say the one plus two attending online versus in person is that you didn't have to constantly be running around trying to find which building the talk was in or end up going into the wrong talk. Um, I was talking to a global gathering yesterday and someone mentioned that it was great that if they started watching a presentation that they weren't interested in, they could just move to another one. Whereas if we were in person, it'd be very awkward to have to kind of stand up in the middle of the presentation, leave the room and try and find something else to go and look at. I thought that was a great benefit of the event. Um, if you didn't attend online, um, the way that it was presented was almost like a TV channel. We had the main keynote in the morning, and then from there, you could pick either the developer, the admin, the architect, or the community and ecosystem tracks that had sessions going on throughout the day. Um, one of the highlights that I would suggest going and checking out from the event are all of the Ask the Expert panels. There was an Ask the, Ask the Expert panel in each of the tracks, um, which was a live Q&A with loads of the product managers. Um, answering some of the tough questions uh, that the community has for them. As well as at two o'clock, we had the classic true to the core session, um, which had a lot of great information and insights uh, about a lot of those new products. Now, there's one thing I did want to point out um, is if you haven't checked it out, go and check out the demos. And the online demos were meant to be um, sort of a representation of going up to a booth and getting a quick demo from someone at a booth at the conference in the expo area. And if I just pop over to that web page, um, what you'll see here is we have demos for all kinds of different products, a lot of the new dev tools and features um, that were written and demoed directly by a lot of the product managers who are much more knowledgeable than any of us ever will be because they're their products. And so I'd suggest go in, check out those demos, bookmark them because they're not going anywhere, um, and they're great references to all of those products. Um, I was lucky enough to contribute to them and I did the APIs and integration demo where we looked at a lot of the change data capture functionality of the EMP API and some of the stuff that's been coming and improving in that sense. And so I'll make sure this link gets shared out afterwards, but definitely bookmark this and go and check out those demos because they're really cool and informative. Now, 
There are three new product announcements that I wanted to actually call out um, and give you a little bit more detail on some of them. Um, and those are the DevOps Center, one that was eagerly, ha has been eagerly awaited for a while from what I've heard from a lot of the customer feedback. We then have Code Builder, um, which is the new web IDE that you're gonna be able to use to create almost a new development experience on Salesforce. And then the last is Functions, that used to be called Evergreen. We now have Salesforce Functions officially introduced I know we did talk about it at Dreamforce, but I think we've really got a good look at it since then. Um, that dev preview has been running for a few months now, and I think the product is really matured and we're able to show some really cool stuff at Trailhead DX from Functions. Um, each of these topics does have a talk you can go and watch um, that's streamed live as long as you just register on the Trailhead DX website, as well as each of these will have a demo that you can go and watch as well for a bit more one-on-one -on -one detail around the products. But I'm gonna go in as best I can and talk about some of the use cases and some of the benefits that I've seen, as well as some ways that they relate into the real world as well. Um, and like I said, I used to run a Salesforce practice, a small team of about 20 developers, admins, architects. Um, and one of our biggest challenge was always release management and continuous integration. Um, and there are many ways that we've all been running this ourselves. Um, I can't tell you the amount of just Ant scripts that I've written to uh, try and automate deployments as best possible and on the fly, uh, not even source tracking, but trying to just diff as much as possible while deploying and seeing a product like the DevOps Center come to life, I think will really um, almost reimagine the way that we run deployments on Salesforce by linking together our work items, bringing in some of our pro like classic project management tools from the product perspective and then link that in with the CI and release management tools provided by, at least in the current example we're using by GitHub. Um, and I think a really big part of this is sort of the UI and the UX associated to it. And the real, the real key to this is that release management hub, um, which is where everything's gonna really be management, managed from. Uh, changes are automatically tracked and done in the development environment like your sandboxes and then just and handle some of that direct syncing and integration um, and actually pushing those comments into your git repo to then start actually managing pull requests in the salesforce ui um, go and check out the demo to actually see some of it there's not anything that i can show you today but it's really cool now as a pair to this because obviously this is a product we're working on um, there's no pilot available for this yet. I actually wanted to highlight some of the work that we do as the developer evangelist team um, when it comes to release management and actually our working cycle. Um, a lot of you know that we maintain the Trailhead sample apps. And if you go to the Trailhead apps GitHub repo, you can see everything that we're currently working on. Now, I'm going to pop into the eBikes repo, which is the one that I maintain as a developer evangelist. And something that we're actually working on this week is writing jest tests for all of the Lightning Web components. And so what you can see here is if you pop into the pull requests for all of the sample apps, you can see the stuff that we're working on today as a developer evangelist team. For example, I was writing a test for the account map component and I did some stuff that wasn't correct. So I've got lots of comments there to go and fix. Um, but you can see how we work from a release management perspective. And to take that to the next level, if you go into the actions tab, you can see how we've set up GitHub Actions um, and really bring this together. And for each of our pull requests, for example, you can see my account map on it here. You can see it will go through um, and then first off, go and try and deploy it to Scratch org, um, check the formatting and linting to verify that everything is formatted properly. And then we'll actually go through and try and deploy everything. And you can see here that we have an issue on the pushing to source. And that's something we can then go in and investigate from that perspective. Now, this is all automated based off the actions that have been created. Now, I'm in no way an expert at this or at actions, um, but Philippe has done a talk on Trailhead Live where he talks about actually writing your own CI with GitHub Actions. Um, and I'll definitely share this link for you, but that will give you an ins a little bit of insight into how we're running it from a developer evangelist perspective. Currently, before we have any tools um, like the um, release management hub or any of the DevOps center tools to use. Um, and it's a great place to start, at least to start with how some of these things might be interacting with Salesforce, because a lot of the underpinning aspects of the, um, the DevOps center will be integration with GitHub and actually pushing and managing that source using Salesforce DX uh, as time goes on. 
Um, so from there, and, and if you have any questions, happy to take them at the end of the session, um, and we'll go through and, and put those together. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, which I can dig into a bit more detail on, is Code Builder. I'd love to know how many people were surprised by, by this announcement at Trailhead DX, um, because it's not really something that we, we, we saw coming. Um, but it's a very welcome addition to our tool set, at least from my perspective. Um, I've really adopted VS Code in the last six months. Um, I've been using a different IDE up until then. Um, and whatever your development environment, great, as long as you're writing good code, that's all that matters. Um, but bringing VS Code into the browser, I think, will be a real game changer, especially for my development um, skill set and, and tool set because of how many orgs that I have. I think not having to wire up every single org that I'm working on to my IDE on my machine will be a huge cost and time savings to myself. Um, but what's even better about it is it's taking that same experience that we have working with VS Code on our desktop into the browser. It's bringing all of the extensions that we're becoming reliant on. It's bringing your configuration and the same tool set and plugins into that browser environment. Um, and I think what's great is it's really gonna bring together everything into that unified experience. I mean, something that's new that we saw within the demo is that Sockel Builder, I've got a slide on it in a minute, but that's something that will be nice and, and much nicer to use than some of the tool sets that we have already. It's worth noting that we're not getting away of the developer console, but I do see that um, the web IDE um, will be so much more beneficial, I think, to our development and having things like all of the language servers, and I'm not sure if any of you use tab nine to add a little bit of intelligence to that, just it creates such a different and unique experience that it should really increase our productivity. Also, not to mention finally being able to write lightning web components in the browser, instead of having to always move off onto your machine to do it. Um, but from a larger perspective, and if we start looking at what it actually takes for a business, I don't know if any of you work with large enterprise companies, but in order to get approval for running a lot of these tasks, for using the CLI, for using plugins, for using custom plugins that aren't signed, there's a lot of red tape that you might have to cross in order to actually get something like that approved for use within a business, whereas the currently developer console, you just open a tab and it runs in the browser. Well, with Code Builder, that's what's going to happen. You won't have to worry about having approvals to install software onto your computers in order to have a good development experience. You'll be able to do it within the browser and have a really similar experience to that. Now, um, some of the things, like I said, the highlights that are sort of advantages um, to how we're working now within the browser is obviously number one, being able to write lightning web components on the fly. Um, and another one is I do a lot of, of, well, sorry, I did a lot of building where I'd scaffold out a component and an admin might go into when we're talking org components, an admin would then go into the developer console and maybe change some twe text, tweak some things. And in Lightning Web Components, we don't really have that. The admin would then have to start learning some of the tool set. Well, with Code Builder, they can just spin it up as if it were the developer console and start making those changes. Um, obviously, Sockel query completion in the browser, uh, being able to test in the browser, and then being able to retrieve the org metadata all within the browser, I think it's just going to be a huge benefit um, that will be seen very quickly as people start to adopt Code Builder. Um, and the same thing, and just to drive on top of that, um, there's a really good Git integration into the Web IDE. Um, you can once again use whatever CI CD pipeline you're using, whether that be GitHub Actions, Jenkins, or something else within your organization. Um, and just sort of all of the source track, source checking conflict detection that comes along with our IDE generally. Having that available in the browser is gonna be game changing. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know what everyone else's impressions are. I've been really excited to start using it. Uh, um, we've had sort of limit really getting tested out, but I think I've pushed it to its, cap its max really at the moment and really impressed with the results from actually starting to develop and write tools within Salesforce inside of Code Builder. Um, there is currently registration. Um, oh, actually, sorry. For functions, there's registration for Code Builder Pilot. Um, if you're an ISV, talk to your partner account manager. If you're a partner, talk to your account manager. If you're a customer, see if they can get you into that pilot. But we're currently running it closed at the moment with a, a look at having an open pilot in the fall. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I'm sure it'll be all over Twitter, all over Slack once that starts coming.
um, n is available. Now, the last of the three that I'd like to just touch on, um, obviously Salesforce functions aren't necessarily new. We announced it at Dreamforce, um, but as I said, we've got to take a really good look at that functionality um, at Trailhead DX. I can say I've had um, about three or four months of actually starting to use functions. I'm not sure if any of you are in the developer preview, but that we do have a sign-up form for, and I can go ahead and show that out after the session. Um, but functions are really cool. Um, I've been writing functions using AWS Lambda for quite a while now, almost since their inception. Um, and it's great for bringing sort of tasks into Salesforce that use a high volume of CPU, maybe need to go and do longer processing of data um, and offloading them into a function. Um, at its risk, functions will be uh, able to be deployed in Node.js, in JavaScript and TypeScript, um, in written in Java or deployed as Apex classes into functions. Um, once again, go check out the demos and some of the, and the talk at Trailhead DX to see some of the detail of this, but there's some really cool stuff going on. An example of something that I've been playing around with is I really like using uh, a, an image uh, manipulation service called Cloudinary, and Cloudinary have some really good APIs for image manipulation, um, removing backgrounds from pictures, doing text overlays, doing object detection inside of images, um, and that's a great task that I can then write against a function, call my function from Apex, and then push that activity to do all of the file manipulation outside of Salesforce, and then just fire back a URL where that image will then be hosted and write that back to the record so that I'm not having to worry about manipulating that file on platform or keeping that file on platform. I can just offload it from that function. Um, and I can't wait to see all the really cool use cases that start coming out of functions because they're very, very powerful. And by offloading that capability, um, it's gonna create a huge advantage. Um, I ran a Trailhead Live session about three weeks ago on integrating external data into Lightning Web Components. And in that session, um, I needed to take an endpoint that had just a flat JSON file that was about seven megabytes large. I wanted to bring that into Salesforce, calculate the distance from a geolocation, and then display like the nearest three schools within DreamHouse um, in the component. But that JSON file breaks our, our file size limits within Apex. And so I wasn't able to just go out and get that and start playing around with that data. I actually had to write an API myself where I wrote an API uh, in Go that then did all of the data manipulation and then just fed back to Salesforce those three nearest schools. Well, with functions, you don't have to worry about that. You can run the call out from the function, get that data, manipulate it, and feed it back into Salesforce without having to jump off platform to complete that action. Uh, and I think that all of those little tiny use cases are going to make a really big difference when it comes to developing within Salesforce in the future as that product starts to grow and evolve. Now, I want to just touch on a few things from the other tracks that I think might be interesting to a developer audience. And I think work.com is something that hasn't had a lot of attention yet from developers. But I think work.com really brings in a new aspect of development into the Salesforce world when we start talking about working with employees and employee data. And I don't really want to talk about any of this stuff. What I want to talk about is actually the employee data model. Uh, this was had been introduced sort of under work.com. I think the announcement was sort of overshadowed by the actual products themselves, but every Salesforce org is going to have introduced to it the employee object and related objects to that employee to allow you to much easier, easier um, build apps around employee engagement and really focus on that employee experience from a Salesforce perspective and work on those types of activities. I can't tell you the number of times I've opened up an org and I've got a custom object or two for managing employee data. And this really replaces the need for that. And one of the most, the largest benefits of any standard objects added to the platform is unlimited data storage, um, which always makes a huge difference when it comes to your design decisions uh, and actually building out at a scale. Now, the other one that I think is great for developers, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment, are the architecture decision guides. Now these were put out by the architect evangelist teams, and these are in-depth guides uh, written in Quip um, that allow you to identify what the best tool for the job is, in particular, the architect's guide to record triggered automation, and identifying which record-based triggering um, actions in Salesforce are the most beneficial for a task 
based on what your user needs are for that task. And where I think this is going to come in a lot of handy is when arguing about why we should be writing a trigger or using a before save flow versus someone who wants to write everything in process builder, because it gives us that justification based on that action as a developer and gives us a lot of reassurance around the decisions that we're making when we're choosing which way to process the data from a record based on what activity that is. And I, I definitely share this link, check this out afterwards, that it will come, it will be very beneficial in the future, I can guarantee that. Um, and just for myself, it's great to have backup and reassurance that in the past I know that my decisions have been correct in that sense. Now, um, something that, that I'm quite proud of, I, speaking to um, the team, I, I love building for communities. And so I've built a lot of community apps in the past. Um, and I wanted to point out specifically two new community modules um, that have been introduced in the latest release. And I wanted to show you a, a small technical demo on how I'm using them currently. And they may seem small, but they're gonna really save time when it comes to actually writing Apex um, to get some of this information. So we have two, two new modules. One is to import IDs of the current community. So when you have a Lightning Web component that's in the context of a community, you can just import the ID of that community directly using this module. And the other one is importing the base URL of the community. So if you're doing any kind of complex navigation or routing, it's great to be able to have that URL available to you. Or if you need to then pass that into Apex for any types of processing against the API, although that is much easier to get in Apex uh, generally. Now, what I want to show you is this idea that I have had. Um, if you've been using communities before or in, or in the past, you'll notice there's this menu editor for editing the navigation menu. And uh, I was sort of really digging in trying to figure out what else we could use that menu for, because I find myself constantly building a footer maybe for a community that's driven off of a custom metadata type for storing the links and that footer information. But what I've learned is you can actually use this navigation menu functionality to drive navigation menus or menus themselves throughout the app through your components. And what I want to demonstrate is this nice little social media footer that I've written for a community that's driven 100% by these navigation menus. And so what we're going to do is pop into uh, VS Code here. Um, and what you'll see here in my LWC, like I said, I'm just importing the community ID and then I'm importing that community-based path. Um, there's a couple other things I'm doing. So I have an Apex method for going out and getting the navigation items, which I'll show you in a minute. And then just my navigation mix-in for actually processing that navigation. Um, on rendering of the community, um, I've specified which menu we're gonna be pointing at and I'll go and show you the menu in a moment. But we can see here, I'm then assigning the community ID and the community-based path for us to use. Now, inside of the component itself, what you will see is when that's populated with the community ID, I'll actually go through and just use a wire to call my Apex method. And what that's gonna do actually is go through and call this get connect navigation menu items uh, method. Um, and what's important about this is it uses the connect API to actually query those navigation menu items. Um, you can get direct access to those uh, objects themselves because they are stored as objects, but they don't have the image file associated to the navigation item uh, within the objects. However, if you call them via the connect API, they do include the navigation um, menu item images as part of that response. And so what you can see here is we're just going to go ahead and construct the URL. We actually have to query um, for that navigation link set ID um, that we can query by using the navigation uh, menu name. Um, as an object. And then from there, we can just construct our callout URL here. So we've got our connect API for communities. We specify our network ID, and then we can actually call out to those navigation menu, navigation menu items. And then you can include that image URL. And then once again, you can choose whether or not you want to include the home menu. And in this case, I don't want to. Um, I'm using just my, this, the session ID from the community user um, to call out to that API. Um, you can API I enable your guest users as well within settings. And I'm just taking that response and passing it back to my Lightning Web component. Now, as you can see here, I'm just gonna take those items and iterate over them and then use the image that's provided back in the, um, the payload to display those social navigation menus. So if we go into Community Builder, um, in our settings, in navigation here, 
you'll see we have our navigation menus that we've created. I'm going to go ahead and edit our social links menu. And you here, um, I've just I've created two of them already. Um, once that loads in a moment. Again. There we go. And so I've set one up for Twitter, I've set one up for Facebook. So I'll go ahead and add one for LinkedIn here. We can then specify obviously where that's pointing. I'm sure a lot of you have done this before. Okay. We can choose how the link is then opened and then we can upload an image. So I'll go ahead and search for an image there. I have my LinkedIn. Don't actually. So we'll go ahead and let's just select our Twitter image there, since I didn't prepare that properly. And so we'll have two. We'll have two Twitter logos in our in our social menu for this demo. I'll go ahead and save that. Okay. Now, if I pop over to the community itself and I refresh the page, what you'll see is we should have our third logo there. Oh, let's publish the change. Great. Go ahead and refresh the page, and it will then render our third item there and resize accordingly as I've specified the width within that component itself. Now, if I go into the Lightning Inspector here um, and go ahead and run that transaction again in our actions, we can take a look at what that payload actually looks like when it comes back to us. And so we have our execution here where we're passing in our parameters of the menu name and our community ID, and then we have our results here and our return value of menu items. And you'll see here in that response, it will pass back I don't think I can zoom in on this, but it will pass back the image URL path um, that's valid for that community, the label, the target, the URL, and the URL type. And in there, when we actually go to start navigating, because now we can start navigating to these items, um, in our navigation uh, function here, we can see here that we can start checking to see what type of navigation it is, whether or not it's an external page or an internal page and then specify how we're actually navigating to that. One thing that I found that's quite cool is you can actually navigate to anything that's in that menu. So if we go into that experience builder there and into the navigation items, the, the coolest one that I've been able to do is navigate to a quick action uh, or a global action. And so in here, you can then specify a global action. And by adding that prefix on that we are in the LWC, this will actually create a page on the fly for you that spins up that global action that could be a form um, within the community uh, directly from that navigation menu item. And I just think it's, it's a really cool feature that not a lot of people have really discovered or seen yet. That's then made easier by some of those summer 20 enhancements. Um, I, I can't share the, code, share the code for this just yet because there's a blog post coming out though that's in really good detail on this functionality um, that will be coming out on the developer blog. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that, but some really cool ideas for ways that you can use those navigation items to allow admins to declaratively configure the navigation menu items, change the style, change the look and feel while you've written those in code and started to deploy those out. I think is, is really cool. So now the next thing I wanted to go through is one of the pilots that I can demo today um, because it was part of my session at Trailhead DX and that is the consent event pilot. Um, and just so you get a little bit of context around why that's important, um, obviously I don't need to go into this. We all know that there are loads of privacy laws happening and thus because of that, things are changing from a technology perspective for Salesforce for platforms all over the place. Um, a lot of this is around understanding what types of personal information you have within your Salesforce org, um, how you can give people the power to manage their preferences, how to have that right to be forgotten from your database. What we're going to talk about today is how you can start to orchestrate privacy events across multiple systems. Maybe you have a multi-org implementation. Maybe you have other systems that you need to understand when someone's changed their preferences or opted out or unsubscribed. And then lastly, around documenting privacy activity and the types of information you have to store when capturing this information. Um, and the approach we all might have seen the individual object has been introduced a couple of years ago that allows you to create that unified view between your contacts, leads, users, and person accounts, and even now the employee object. But what's important is that when someone manages their preferences, they're now managed at an individual level. And so that data will then cascade up to a lead, contact, user, person account, wherever you're actually accessing that data from. Um, looking at the way that those objects are configured, we have, we, you may have three leads that are the same person. You may have a contact that's the same person. If you're using communities, you'll have a user that exists for that, that person. 
those are just personas for an individual and the roles they may play within a certain part of Salesforce, but their actually true identity is that individual object record. Um, I did a talk um, on Trailhead Live a few days ago around this. If you wanted to get into how you link them, um, but you can actually use the new consent API to query someone's email address or record ID and then receive back all of the people or records related to that person. It's really cool and beneficial. Um, but then we have a whole number of consent records that we can use to start capturing someone's permission to process their data within Salesforce. Um, now, on top of that, to make things even more complicated, that contact point type consent is just one example. There are actually five different types of consent that you can now log against someone. And all of these objects you see here, I won't go into detail into them, but all of these are standard objects that have been introduced on platform. So if you go into your org, all of these objects, the authorization form consent, party consent, contact point type consent, you would have never known, but these are now all in your environments. Now, what happens when you want to try and sync all of this data into a system that doesn't have this data model? Well, number one, we've enabled change data capture into all of these objects. Obviously now even more with that full list there. Um, that doesn't really help because then you're getting events for each of those objects. So what we've done is created the consent event stream that actually takes the CDC events and compiles them down to a single event stream uh, called a consent event that you can use to track changes to any of those records uh, as they come into Salesforce. And the payload looks like this. It just comes in with whatever that new value is, just like a CDC event, but it also specifies the object name that that has come from by subscribing to just that consent event stream. Now, a great use case for this, for example, is when someone says they'd like to be deleted from your database. If you're managing that interaction within Salesforce, you can then push that out via your event bus, capture it within an event bus elsewhere or any listener that you've set up um, using the REST API, and then go out and broker the deletion of that person's data and then respond back to Salesforce. Now, just wanted to quickly demo this so you can see what that looks like in action. Um, there is a pilot available that you can sign up for um, around the consent events. But for example, if I press the next button here, you'll see here we're just creating an individual object. Um, and that individual here um, will go ahead and then send up two payloads through that consent event stream here. And, and there you'll see that we have an event here for the contact record. And then we have an event here for the individual that's been captured. And then we can see what's been changed there. If I were to create a consent record, once again, you can go through, I won't create one now, but you can see what happens. Um, if I were to change the email opt-out here to true, that's another action that would trigger a consent event um, to the event stream. And so now here we can see we've got a has opted out of email uh, new value here, and then we've had another event in here for the contact. And bear in mind, we've got all of these transactions happening for all of these different objects coming in through one stream. Now, if I wanted to demonstrate to you what it looks like to enrich that data, and so if I go into, for example, this individual Aaron Walsh here, I can go ahead and start modifying some of their preferences and say, okay, we don't want to process, we don't want to market, we want to block this and save that. Uh, with just a simple callback, we can go and enrich that a bit more and style it in a way that our system, wherever we're listening, would want to hear and capture that information. Um, same thing if we were actually to create one of those contact point type consent records. Um, this is just using a Salesforce Labs app that I built for managing these records, where we can go ahead and quickly log a consent for someone. Um, talk about where it's come for and really construct that record online and I can go ahead and save that and you'll see once again that's a, an entirely another uh, su a subject type that's coming in through that same stream for you to capture without having to write loads of different integrations for different types of changes to the data I think it's a really great example of how we're trying to make a lot of these processes easier um, from an event perspective as well I'm sure a lot of you have used platform events in the past um, and CDC as they started to come into play. Um, but I think this is a great example of how we've been able to innovate internally using those same tools and technologies. Um, and now, and pretty much the last thing for, that I wanted to shout out for me is one of my favorite things to do working at Salesforce is build Salesforce Labs apps. Um, and so I have three Labs apps that have just been released. If you wanna go ahead and check out the source code, deploy them into an environment, see what how we've written some of these. I've built a cookie consent app for managing cookie consent in communities uh, that communicates actually with the community document head 
outside of and around Locker to try and get communities back and forth between that com component and the browser. Uh, a multi-org security summary for managing multiple orgs security health checks. And what that does is it takes, it's a package you install into each of your orgs if you have a multi-org environment and sends the security health checks to a centralized org through, so it gets the health checks from the tooling API and then pushes out to an endpoint where we capture them and write them into the org. And the last one is just a utility that I've written for myself a while ago and have been using for a long time that I like to call the lightning messaging utility that brings in all of the alert banners, inline errors, prompts, illustrations into a single lightning web component that you can use to just quickly display those illustrations and error messages uh, if and when need be, instead of having to go back to the SLDS website and just copy and paste them every time you're building a new component. Um, and that's it for me from that perspective. So if you want, wanted to take it next and talk about Q&A, see what we want to do. Awesome.